for that. I'm just loving my time here. I've uh, just been here a few hours, but it's been great. Even hearing Becky, uh, I mean, I realize this, I, I haven't heard you in years. Last time I heard you um, was in the 80s. <laughs> I, I was in high school, college, and uh, I mean, that's, no, yeah, <laughs> no, that, that, I don't take that as an insult. I mean, that's a, a compliment to go, gosh, 35 years later, still preaching the word of God, but still in love with Jesus, with this joy and life. So, so good to be here. Um, the last time I spoke at something like this, uh, I was leaving and my wife says to me, hey, just be yourself. Don't try to sound smart. Because whenever you do that, it just doesn't come across right. And they don't, they don't invite you for that reason. You know, so I don't know how to take it. But, uh, but it, what's nice about being at this gathering is I don't, I, I don't feel that pressure. Um, you know, and I know some of you are, are, you know, God has gifted you in a very special way. And I hope you really take a cue from uh, uh, the ministry here where one of the things is that I've always loved about RZM is, is just their, the way they value every part of the body. And, and sometimes for those of us who don't have, you know, the, the same intellect as others, we can feel less than or be made to feel less than, but I've never thought that from anyone on this team here but this graciousness, and I pray that that just continues and spreads into the body of Christ. Um, you know, my daughter and I were just talking back there. I go, gosh, I would just love to follow Ravi around for, you know, a few months and just, you know, listen and observe. And I don't know, maybe we work it out sometime. I, I just, seriously, I just, I love you. I just love you. And... Um, so when I was asked to speak here, I just immediately said yes. I didn't know the topic or what it really was about. I just, any chance I get to be around this ministry, I'm just grateful for it. And then they told me the topic, blessed are the peacemakers. And it didn't, it didn't really, I just thought, okay, that's fine. That's cute. You know, let's just, <laughs> I, that's, that's good. That's a, it's, a, it's biblical, you know, but it, it, it didn't do anything for me at that time. I just thought, okay, I'll keep that in mind. And it is crazy how in the sovereignty of God, the way he just orchestrates everything and suddenly leading up to this event, this is all that's on my mind is the unity of the church and, and being peacemakers because I'm understanding biblically how important it is to him. You know, like, like, like if he had it his way, we would be so united in this room. You know, as believers in Jesus Christ, believing that we are literally members, literally members of his body somehow, mysteriously, right? Like Ephesians 5 says, it's a profound mystery that somehow we are one with him and we are individually members of his body. So right now I'm connected to almighty God. He nourishes and cherishes me like I'm a part of his body. Are you kidding me? The God who dwells in unapproachable light the one who can't be touched, the one that Moses says, you can't look at me and live through that. And he's saying that I'm, I'm one with him somehow. And you are one with him somehow. And his desire is that we're so overwhelmed by that, that we're just all in here going, are you kidding? Or can you believe I'm a part of this? I know, me too. And we're just, so we're unified, rejoicing in the fact that we're pure. We're children of God, and we're just all in awe, and we're just bonded. I mean, I just recently, uh, uh, on Monday, on Monday, we just took a, a family picture. You know, we hadn't done that in forever. I don't know if they sent, did they send that picture? I, okay, you can put it on there. Um, this, is, this is my family, okay? And uh, I've got seven children, and then this is a son-in-law with my 
granddaughter, and then there's this future son-in-law. They're engaged, and probably too close right there. But <laughs> it, it's just... <laughs> but my family... You know, like, I right now... Like, I don't even need friends. I could just take my family. Let's just go to an island, and let's just hang out till we die. Like, there is such a bond and unity and I know my family's not perfect but some days I really feel like it is uh you know earlier this year my wife and I celebrated 25 years and at dinner she's like honey do you think there's anyone on the planet more blessed than we are she goes, I, I keep thinking there's got to be, but I just don't know of anyone that's even as close to being as blessed as we are. And to, to hear that from my wife of 25 years, and I'm, I'm just like, amen, and yes, like this is, this is so insane, like what, what God's built here, like, like we all cheer each other on, there's, there's no fighting, there's no arguing, and, and every once in a while, you know, like, like, like a, a few weeks ago, my... Uh, my older son, you know, who's, I've got a really broad spectrum. I've got this four-year-old or three, four, how old is he? Is he four? Okay. <laughs> four-year-old son, 23-year-old daughter, you know, so everything. And, and so, you know, you know, teenage boys, they can kind of pick on their little brothers. And, and he starts, you know, uh, just teasing him a little bit to where he starts whining and crying. And there's something fun about that. I was a big brother too, you know, right? <laughs> and my wife just, she just, she just kind of had it, you know, in one of those moments where it's just too much. And she just looks at my son, Zeke. She goes, Zeke, I don't know what kind of sick pleasure you get from teasing your little brother till he cries. But you know what? It's driving me crazy. So stop. And she, he just looks at her and is like, I'm sorry, mom. Immediately. I'm sorry, mom. I'm sorry, Mom. It's done. Because they know you can, you can take that off. It's, it's just, we, we want unity in our family. Like, but the moment Mom said, he's like, okay, sorry. God, man, he wants oneness amongst us. Okay? He wants it. I, I, I think about like 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 one one day you know my wife and I will be gone and 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 I, I want nothing more than to know that my kids are still that unit like nothing's getting you know I love how they're already talking about doing ministry together and, and working together I love how my my two that are in high school are like yeah next year we're gonna lead the, the Christian club in our secular school and we're gonna you know yeah I think I'm gonna be an evangelist you know like let's work together like I want this. I mean, what if there was one of my kids that suddenly wanted to divide the others? And say, hey, let's, let's stay away from Rachel, you know, or let, let's stay away from Mercy. Let's, it, as a parent, what that would do to me, like, are you kidding me? And what if there was that one kid that just said, no, we're not going to fight. This is not what dad wanted. This is not the way he raised us. This, he, he would be sick of this. And, and I, I refuse to hate any of you. And, and if there was that one kid that was just trying to bring everyone together, I would just be looking at that going, okay, that's my favorite right there. <laughs> you know, right? Right, because we want that. And, and that's the type of child I want to be in the sight of God. That says, look, I'm not going to fight with you. We're going to figure this out. We're going to work this out because there's something about unity that is so powerful. I mean, why did Jesus pray for that right before he went off to be crucified? Why, why was it such a big deal to him at the end of his life here on earth that he said, okay, Father, I'm coming to you and here's my prayer, right? The, the time's come. Glorify your son as your son's glorified you. It's time for me to go back. I've accomplished everything you wanted me to do. But now my prayer is for these I'm leaving behind. And I'm not just praying for them, right? I'm praying for those who will believe in me because of their message. That's us. And what does he pray there in John 17? I can't read it. I forgot my glasses. Okay. Okay. He says, 
<laughs> he says, I and them and you and me, may they be brought to complete unity so that the world may believe that you have sent me and have loved them even as you've loved me. Okay? He, this is his prayer. God, I and them, you and me, bring them. Okay? I'm going to the cross right now. Okay? I'm leaving these people that I love. Here's my prayer. Make them one. I and them, you and me, bring them to complete unity. Why? So that the world would believe that you sent me. Okay, that is a strange equation. So I and them, you and may they be brought to complete unity. So bringing us to complete unity equals so that the world may believe that you sent me. See, that as an equation, that doesn't even make sense to me. Because I go, that? See, see when I was young, I, I was telling the, the team at lunch how one of the first books I read as a believer in high school was Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. I was so into apologetics and just started preaching it to, to my school. Any chance I got, I would bring up facts with my teachers, you know, going into the city college, start challenging professors with some of this knowledge. And, and so in my mind, and, and, and I loved it. I loved it. I, it gave me like a, a backbone, like, hey, this isn't just like some fairy tale here. There's something behind. There's truth to this. Um, but in my logic, for years even, I kept thinking, okay, if we can just prove it to them, through archaeology, history, prophecy, how can they deny it? And maybe we'll even bring, you know, then I became a youth pastor, and it's like, okay, and then I'll bring in, like, maybe the, the captain of the football team and the head cheerleader, if they come to Christ, and maybe we'll bring in some famous people who believe in Jesus. That's what's going to convince them that Jesus is the Son of God. Just get people smart enough. Because that, that makes sense in my mind. That makes great sense in my mind. That we can just logically explain it to them. But that's not what Jesus said would work. Jesus says, when you become perfectly one. See, that, that equation to me messes with my logic. I'm like, how would our oneness make the world believe that Jesus is the Messiah, right? I, I mean, Paul says it in uh, Philippians 1, 27. You know, he talks about how if we strive side by side, unafraid of anything. Then the world's going to believe in their destruction and of your salvation and that from God. It's like, wait, so... If we align ourselves and strive side by side, they're going to believe in their destruction? No one believes in their destruction. No one believes in a day of judgment. But again, that doesn't make sense to me. Like, my logic is like, I don't get how unity is going to work. I don't see how unity is going to prove the Messiah. I don't see how unity is going to prove a day of judgment. You got to understand this book is filled with illogical uh, equations. I don't understand how marching around a city seven times will do anything. I don't understand how touching a staff into water is going to do anything. Right? There is this element of faith that, well, well God says this is going to work. And so as we talk about apologetics, man, praise God for that. But somehow in that, Jesus also says uh, there's, there's something that we do as the church that is the apologetic. There's something that we cannot do alone. It's as we are, are, are at peace with one another. Blessed are the peacemakers. And, and, and at the same time, he also says, oh, I'm going to read this. Um, 
I was looking at this. Are these like readers? Yes, okay, they're not like crazy. Um, they're really dirty. Um, <laughs> could have cleaned them first. Um, um, I'm just kidding. That's it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right, sorry, sorry. Here we go, starting fights again. Um, no, thank you. <laughs> okay, Proverbs... Ah, oh, this is great. <laughs> Proverbs 6, verse 16. There are six things that the Lord hates. Let's just tremble at these words like God tells us to. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Okay, I can't explain the construct of the Hebrew there, but from what I understand from people I read, that there, there's some way in which that is uh, structured out so to where the emphasis is on that seventh thing, being that absolutely abomination. I mean, we tremble. These are the things that you want to know what he hates? Here it is. Here's six things, and then there's that seventh. Really, it's seven that are an abomination. It says this. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. You want to know what I hate? It's kind of like what I was saying about my family. You know what I would hate is if one of you kids started dividing the fam. That, that would drive me nuts. You try to tear apart this family that I love so much and the unity that I, that, that I, just, I just cherish and value so much. You're going to tear. You, you know what I hate? If any of you try to split up my family... And God said, that's an abomination to me. That's why, that's why we have these, these strong warnings, like in, in um, Titus. Titus chapter, chapter 3, verse 10. As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. Knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. God said, look, division, look, don't, don't put up with, the, I'll give you permission to just, I, I, I'm telling you, have nothing to do with that person. You warn him though. You warn him, you warn him again, and then have nothing to do with him. I can't have division in my body. I can't have someone in there trying to divide brother and sister. This is, this is, this is crazy. There's the warning, the warnings in 1 um, first, first, uh, Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. Do you not know that you, plural, you guys even say, you guys say y'all. You, do you not know that y'all, all y'all, <laughs> are God's singular temple? So you together are God's singular temple and God's spirit dwells in you. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. In his eyes, he goes, I want you to be like living stones. You know, that passage, like he talks about that in Peter. I want you to be like, like, like stacked on top of each other. You all forming one temple. It's not just about this individual me having the Holy Spirit in me. It's about us making a temple like that Old Testament. Once they got it all done and Solomon prays that prayer, then fire comes down in that temple. And there's something about us us coming together in unity, forming one temple, striving side by side. And he said, if anyone destroys that temple, God will destroy him. 
That's why this is a warning. That's why Titus says, look, warn the divisive poor person. This, this is not a, a little thing that you're dealing with. That, that if, I, if I start gossiping about Becky to, to Ravi, I mean, that would be weird. But, you know, let's just say, oh my gosh, Becky, whatever. You know, it's just, that's a big deal. That's a really big deal. Because God wants unity. He hates this is an abomination when there's some sort of stirring up amongst the brothers because he wants so badly for his glory to be seen. He wants so much for people to understand who Jesus is. And our oneness is vital to that. Last week I was in Africa and... Uh, a few months ago, I was in the same area because there's, there's a tribal war going on. A couple million people are displaced, starving, you know, just homeless, like running for their lives, trying to get aid to them, everything else. But we find out that uh, many of these people in these two tribes claim to be believers. And there's, there's pastors on both ends. And and pastors are seeing their friends killed and, and they, they're, just, they're right in the, the tribal war with everyone else. And, when, and, and we said, well, let's, you know, we were going to do a pastor's conference. The, the leaders out there as peacemakers, they, they grab 50 pastors from one tribe and 50 from another and put them in separate locations and then brought them together. And asked me to preach to them. And they said, we don't know what's going to come. We don't know what's going to happen when we bring them together. This hasn't been done. And there's a lot of anger. There's this, that, whatever. There, there have been family members killed. They've watched. These are the, many of them have lost their homes and everything else. have nowhere to go. And the word of God. At that time, we were studying 1 John in our Bible reading, so I just, I just started teaching through 1 John. It's like, you can't, you can't hate your... You're a liar if you say you know God and you hate your brother. I, I, don't, I don't care what you say. I don't care what you call yourself. The Bible says you're a liar. You don't know God. How can you, how can you say you know God whom you can't see? We don't love your brother whom you can just the word of God, seeing the power of the word of God and the tension start to ease up in that room. And then by the end of our time, just a few hours, suddenly they're washing each other's feet, sobbing and locking arms and singing some song that I, I didn't know what they're saying. The translators telling me that they're saying we will not be divided. We will not be divided. And they're talking, let's go marching into where some of these volatile areas are united, arm in arm. And it's, it's like, man, the beauty of that. The beauty of a peacemaker. And just, just in God's eyes as he's watching these, these pastors working to, to bring some sort of peace. There, 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 there's, a, there's just a power to it. The Bible promises that. The problem is division is so much easier, isn't it? Oh, it is so easy. Like I said, let me just grab my family. We'll just go to an island and we all get along and you guys go do whatever you want. Um, it's so much easier. Some of us grew up in different denominations and it's, it's easy if you, if you grew up conservative, evangelical, to just... Just stay in your circle and talk about how those charismatics don't know the word of God. They just go by feelings. They don't care about hard truth. They're just all about their visions. And then if you grew up in a more charismatic setting, just stay in your little circle and talk about how those conservatives are so arrogant and divisive and powerless, and they just strategize all these different things, and they're not even about the power of the Spirit. And then 
We all agree in our little circles. Like that, that shrimp illustration was awesome. That little puddle, you know, uh, it's like we, we, we're just in our own little world. And that's so much easier. So much easier. I, I grew up in more of a conservative background. And, you know, when it gets difficult is, one, you understand the word of God. And you understand what God wants for his body. But the, the more difficult thing is when you start traveling into different circles. And you start meeting people. And you go, Whoa. He seems like he really loves God. I, I remember I, I was on this board uh, um, where another guy on the board was Jack Hayford. And uh, some of you know he's charismatic. And, and he started teaching one time. And I'm like, whoa, you know the Bible? <laughs> like, it was the craziest. No, seriously, I, it really was a shock to me. He starts digging into the Hebrew and everything else. We get to know each other. I'm like, I need to apologize. Years later, I, I spoke in an event. I don't know, this is going to be controversial to some people. Um, with this guy named Mike Bickle. And, uh, and I'm picked up at the airport. I didn't realize, how, you know how much issue was going to be stirred up by that. A guy picks me up at the airport, you know, and I'm, I'm getting all this feedback of like, man, how could you be with this guy or whatever else? And one of his staff picks me up and I'm like, man, tell me about the ministry here because I'm getting all sorts of like emails and hate mail um, just for coming here. And he goes, well, let me just tell you this. There's only two guys I read, Mike Bickle and John MacArthur. I'm like, what? That doesn't even make sense, you know? And he goes, oh, man, we love John MacArthur here. I'm like, what? The, the, the word of God, you know, everything else. And, and, and the more I got to know Mike, I'm going, oh, my gosh, you love the Lord. As I start talking to his staff and the people, around, how much time does he spend in that prayer room? How much time does he spend in the word? Wait, you're against all the emotionalism and, the, and he's just speaking against the excesses in the charismatic church. And I'm like, what? I go, no, 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 this isn't true. I studied you in seminary. This is not, I just had to apologize going, you're one of the godliest men I've ever met and I'll stand with you. I remember speaking at a passion event and worship leader that I was, connected with, you know, we're going to do the session. I just really got to know each other. Love this guy. Um, he, he uh, Matt Marr, you know, he wrote, uh, your grace is enough. And so excellent. You know, we're, we're just cranking along, getting to know each other. Go, man, this guy loves Jesus. And then partway through, he drops a bomb on me and tells me he's Catholic. I'm like, <laughs> Your grace is enough? <laughs> he goes, I know. Can you believe that was written by a Catholic? I go, that doesn't even, you don't even believe that. Like, well, how, you know, and we just started. And, and just, I'm just telling you, you get, you start talking to some of these people. And, and then I'm at this gathering where, 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 where there's this group called the Charismatic Catholics. You put the two together, it's like, get away from, you know, and... <laughs> And they're asking, will you, here's what they're asking their leaders. A couple priests are saying, will you come just preach the gospel to our people? I'm so concerned that so many of our people have never heard the gospel. Like we actually are okay when they leave the Catholic church and go and hear the gospel somewhere else. We just want them to hear the gospel and to know the gospel. We're deeply concerned for our own people. I'm like, What? So you just want me to preach the gospel? I'm just telling you, it's not that easy to just, you start meeting these people that really love the Lord and you're trying to categorize them and it's so much easier to just keep them away. But when you see a true brother or sister that maybe speaks in tongues when you don't or doesn't even believe in tongues when you do, and, 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 you know, it's, it's just all of this. It's so much easier to just say, 
just stay away. You go over there, you go over here, go over here, you know, and just make some sort of trivial, oh yeah, yeah, we're united type of thing rather than saying, no, we're going to become one and I need you, I need you, I need you. And I don't have the answers to it all. And I, I will say, I, I, I've made mistakes. Man, I don't say everything perfectly. And, and I was watching a video of, of me teaching at this thing and and afterwards, I'm like, you know, this is from a couple years ago. I literally, I saw so much arrogance in the way that I taught and how hurtful and divisive that, that, that could have come across. I literally started crying when I saw a video of myself teaching. Going, God, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. My arrogance right there probably brought division. And so I just want to publicly say, man, there are things I say sometimes. I get so passionate about the church that may sound like I act like I know it all about the church and that every other church is screwed up except whatever I'm doing. I am so sorry if I ever come across that way. I, I apologize for my lack of clarity sometimes. You know, I get so passionate about one thing that I don't give the entire picture. I remember, I don't know, like five years ago, there was a big discussion about me throughout the internet of how I'm a, a poverty gospel theologian. And that I believed you had to be poor in order to be a believer. And, you know, it was a cover of Christianity Today and everything else. And people were discussing this poverty theology that I was espousing. And then a few months ago, it was, they're saying I'm a prosperity guy now. <laughs> and and uh, so I kind of pride myself on being the only one that's both somehow. <laughs> um, but I understand it's, it's, it's probably my fault. Like I'm not clear on some of these things. And, and just so you know, I mean, I, let me just real quickly tell you, I'm neither. Um, I don't believe you have to be poor to be a believer. Um, Maybe some statements I made as I saw the poor overseas that made me want to sacrifice and give to them. And, and it was a joy and it was out of love. It wasn't because I believed that that's the way to heaven and that everyone has to be poor. It, it just, I, I really was just overwhelmed by the need and thought, let me sacrifice everything. I was encouraging other people to do the same, but it wasn't like a requirement to salvation. And if, if it sounded that way or made it come across that way, because one guy even wrote a parable about me and said, it was like a, a, a dad gives his kid a bike and, and then the son says, well, not everyone in the world has a bike, so I don't want the bike. It's like, no, that's not exactly it. It's like, it's, it's more like my dad gave me a bike and $10 million. And I go, I don't need the $10 million. Do you mind if I pass it out? And he says, yeah, that's actually why I gave it to you. Okay, that's the parable. Um, it's, it's just... It's, 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 that's where my heart was. It wasn't, I can't enjoy the things that God's given me because he does give me things and I do enjoy them. So I'm not this poverty guy. And then as far as the prosperity gospel end, uh, it was because someone took a picture with me and, and uh, that, that, you know, and I speak at events with, with different people. I don't know all their theologies. I, honestly, Becky, I don't know yours. You might be one. I, I mean, I don't know... <laughs> I don't go researching because I believe, and, and I've talked to my elders in my church, and we believe, you know what? You just go wherever. You go wherever. And, and I don't know who's always on the stage. I don't know who's always on the crowd. I don't know who always takes a picture of me. But here's what I, I get concerned about. is, is like when I look at a person like, like, uh, like Sam, okay, I don't, I don't know what box you, you, you would label yourself in. Like, I would just think to Sam, and I would look, i go, there's an eternal soul in there. And man, I don't know if you know the gospel. I don't know if you really know what you're about to face up there. And I don't know if you really know him. I mean, just because you're at this conference doesn't mean anything. Do you know him? At the end, like, I'm, I'm thinking about this is eternal stuff. And I, if I have an opportunity to go anywhere and have the opportunity to present the life-saving, eternal, soul-saving gospel of Jesus Christ. Like, I will go there at the risk. I understand there's a risk of being misunderstood. 
But you've got to understand the greater risk of the gospel not going into some of these places. And so that's my heart. And no, I'm not a prosperity gospel guy. I don't think you can find a single sermon or statement from any of my preaching for the last 30 years that would lead me there. But I apologize, okay, if I bring any of this on through a lack of clarity, but can we move on and, and pursue this oneness and, and, and then sometimes fight against some of this divisiveness? And, and it feels like, um, sometimes it can feel like uh, impossible. You know, like we talked about earlier, like you, you look at this, this chasm and you're going, okay, Francis, you're saying there's believers in all of these different denominations. It seems like from when I go around and I meet people, I'm, in, I'm constantly in shock because I'm told certain things. And it's true. There are stereotypes and there's a reason for those stereotypes. And absolutely. Are there charismatics out there that do not know the word of God and don't really even care to and just want to dream tonight? Sure, there are. Are there conservatives that are so stinking arrogant and just think anyone that speaks in tongues is an idiot? Yes, I was one of them. Okay, but then there's these other people that just, in so many different camps, that seem to really love. Some of you guys are nodding your heads that have been around. And you go, what do I do with this? And I don't always answer it properly. You know, don't you always walk away from conversations, whether it was in believers or whoever, and you go, oh, I should have said this. Oh, I should have said that, right? I'm going to do that. I'm going to make mistakes. We all are. It's just, I've got to figure out, not even figure out, it's not up to me. I've just got to work towards this oneness because something is supposed to happen when we become perfectly one that Satan doesn't want. That's what 2 Corinthians 2 is about, where Paul says, hey, I'm not unaware of his schemes. Remember, that's where he says, there, there was, it seems like that was the maybe possibly the 1 Corinthians 5 guy who committed immorality. The church probably excommunicated him. Sounds like he wanted to repent, possibly. And then the church is like, ooh, do we forgive him? We're like, Paul's like, yes, yes, bring him back in. I forgive him. If, if, if you guys forgive him, I forgive him. We, there's got to be unity. He goes, I didn't even want to come to you guys because I didn't want to make you sad. Because if I make you sad, you're not going to make me happy. And you guys are the ones that make me happy. It's like, there's, we're supposed to get together and bring joy and, and, and everything else. Make sure, don't, don't, Satan's trying to divide us. We're not unaware of his schemes. So, okay, let's just deal with whatever we need to deal with with. Tell me, tell me the sin in my life. Let's work it through. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If I've done anything that offends you, I'm sorry. But we've got to, daddy, daddy, daddy who always wanted us to be one. He wanted us to be one. We've got to fight for it. And, and yes, it just seems like an impossible task, right? Sometimes I dream, hey, this is the generation because it doesn't matter if you call yourself Baptist anymore. I don't know if you really know Jesus until I sit down, spend some time with you, see the fruit of the Spirit in your life. You can go to any church. I don't even know the name of it. It's just about, man, whether the Spirit is in you, it takes time to see that in someone's life. And it just seems like this impossible task to bring the believers together to be one. But it's what God wants. It's what Jesus prayed for. And we can't be, we just can't be uh, paralyzed by the magnitude of it. One last story, okay. There's one scene that always comes back into my head. It's a weird one um, where I want to relive something. My son was playing Little League Baseball. And the score was like tied, like 12-12, last inning. And his, his buddy got on first, play, first base. And uh, it was a real close call, but they called him safe. I think it was two outs, and my son is up to bat. And I'm like, Zeke, this is where you become a man, dude. <laughs> this is everything. You knock that run in. Meanwhile, everyone's yelling about whether that guy was safe at first. And now pretty soon the coach is on both. I'm just a dad there, you know. Um, They start swearing at each other. These are like nine-year-old kids. And the the coaches and the dads 
starts where F-bombs flying left and right. Women in the stands are getting in each other's faces over whether this guy is safe. And, and I'm looking at this and I just froze because I'm just a dad at a baseball game. It's not like this is my church and I'm the pastor. This is a secular league. I'm just, I'm not even a coach. I'm just standing there watching. And then, and then they start calling each other out to start fighting. And, and I'm like, what do I do? And then I'm looking, you know, God meant dads from my team that are a lot bigger than I am. And, and the coach and some guys over there, a lot bigger than I am. And I thought, oh man, I, I can't do anything. I can't do anything. Sure enough, a fight breaks out. Fist fight, broken leg, ambulance, police. Uh, it was so embarrassing. Eight and nine year old kids. Kids are crying because, you know, my dad, he's going away in the ambulance. It was just, and those kids are, that is a scene they'll remember for the rest of their lives. And I always look back and I go, but I didn't know what to do. But I always think back, Francis, you were scared. You didn't know, because I thought, what do I do? But I could have. I, I, I always relive that. I go, I could have ran on the field right then in the middle of it all and just yelled as loud as I could. I don't even know what to yell. Just, ah, you know, just make a spectacle of myself. You know, I, I live it. You know how you daydream? I could have just said, these are kids. Stop it. Stop it. My kid didn't come. You know, like whatever. I could have done. No, we're not going to do this. Not here. You know, like I could have done something to divert the attention. I, I, I don't even know how it would have ended. I just know I regret not running on the field and just yell something anything, because it would have ended differently. But instead, there it was. See, I think that when I think about the divisions going on in the church right now, I don't know. I don't know how this is going to happen. There's a new heresy hunting ministry every day that's trying to divide this person, this person, this person, this person. I don't know. How are you going to fix that? How are you going to fix all these hundreds of years of division? What, you, what are you just going to run out of I don't know. I just know that this is my start. I'm just going to start yelling. Stop it. You know, no, this isn't what he wanted. I know you're smart and I know you're, you know, just stop. Right? Because he hates this fighting. And when we become one, that's when the enemy is going to lose. That's when the world's going to believe in the Messiah. That's when that fire is going to come down upon the temple like it did in Acts 2. You know, and fall upon his church, his temple, which is us. There's something about that unity. And so, yes, at first I just thought, okay, that's a great little theme. And now I'm just going, no, this is it. You talk about apologetics. Man, God tells us it's when you're one, perfectly one. And maybe it starts with us. Maybe I'm just the one guy that's running on the field yelling and you're all going to beat me up. And it's like, that's fine. Because I want to end up at the end going, Dad, I did everything I could. I was trying to fight to bring it together. I was trying to hold doctrinal lines, but then at the same time, you know, hold on to the, the absolutes and let go of some of the finer points of theology, trying to make it all work out. I just tried to make everyone one. I just want to be one of those voices. And my prayer is that some of you hear me screaming today and your minds are, some of you are way beyond mine to use that gift to actually bring unity to the body. Because there's a, there's, a, there's a danger with those of us who fight for truth. That, that's just it. We're, we're into fighting. And somehow there's been, a, there's, there's been this balance of grace and truth and love here in this ministry that I'm hoping that, that God uses you now as a, as a voice that says, you know, I'm going to use everything I can. I'm going to yell as much as I can. To just say, we got to stop fighting. This is not what dad wanted. This is not what he wanted of his church. This is huge, huge. Satan's getting the victory right now. And we can do something about it. We can do something about it. And I'm just going to yell for the rest of my life. And it doesn't work. It's okay. I stand before God. And God did my best.
you know, just like that kid, you know, in, in my family. He says, Dad, I, I'm trying to bring peace. I'm like, all right, that's all I ask of you. Father, would you just move? Please, Lord. Please, Lord. If Jesus prayed it, that it had to be possible, God, help us get such a view of your glory, such a view and understanding of your holiness and your desire and your heart. Help us to tremble at your word. God, as we combat false teaching, Lord, may we be equally passionate about the unity of your bride. May we not neglect either. Fill us with the love of Christ, Lord. Even this room, Lord. May your Holy Spirit convict those who maybe need to apologize for arrogance, wrongful disassociation, judging, Help us to understand your grace. Help us understand that if we know any truth right now is because of your grace. So how dare we judge? It doesn't even make sense. Holy Spirit, please empower us. Please, Lord, give us wisdom. Put thoughts in our mind. Wisdom from above. How to bring your family together. May we truly be your sons and daughters here by being peacemakers. In Jesus' name, amen.